Welcome to ProGenesis Academy webinar session 52. For those who are not familiar with ProGenesis Academy, we are a nonprofit, non biased education program focused on embryology and reproductive genetics. I would like to take a moment to thank AAB for issuing CUs for our webinars. So if you have not received your certificate of attendance, please let us know so we can provide you with one. If you have missed any of our webinars, you can find them all on Progenesis Academy um, YouTube channel or on our website. Today's topic is the fate of 1PN, 3PN, and mosaic embryos. We have four laboratory directors who are going to help us tackle this important topic. Introducing Vic Holmes, East Coast Corporate Lab Director at CCRM, Mori Javed, Lab Director at Originelle Fertility Clinic and Women's Health Center, Yimin Shu, Lab Director at Women's and Infant Hospital, the Warren Alper Medical School at Brown University, and Bill Vinier, Co-Founder at West and Lab Director at San Diego Fertility Center. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nabil, and I really thank Progenesis Academy to um, arrange uh, these uh, very, very useful uh, seminars. I learned through those webinars myself very much, and uh, I have no conflict of interest um, regarding today's talk. My talk is about the 1PN and 3PN zygotes. And I will be talking uh, from the clinical point of view. Next slide, please. As we know that every human, every normal, genetically normal human being has 46 chromosomes. Female or male, they have equal number of chromosomes. However, at the level of gametes, the egg has 23 chromosomes and the sperm has 23 chromosomes. These are called haploid cells. And at the fertilization, when these sperm and egg chromosomes fuse, then we get 46 chromosomes, and this will result into either genetically normal female or genetically normal male. So uh, can you go back one slide, please? One slide more back, please. One more slide back. Okay, um, according to the Alpha Ashe Istanbul 21 consensus, it is recommended that the fertilization should be checked 16 to 18 hours post insemination. And the normal fertilization is considered when we see true proteoclei and true polar bodies. And that is indicative of 46 chromosomes. Anything other than that, like 1PN, 3PN, 4PN, these are considered abnormal fertilizations. But in routine, many embryologists would agree with me that sometimes we see an egg at fertilization that look like 1PN. I have this situation a few days ago in the lab where I saw this egg and it was 1PN. I was surprised because this was a C and it went very well. So I just shook the slide on the inverted microscope and then all of a sudden I see two pronuclei. This is strange and this happens. So in those cases, my recommendation would be that either you shake the slide a little bit on the inverted scope or take it to the stereoscope and roll the egg with the micropipette to make clear whether this is really 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. Next slide, please. So there are a few other true 1 p.m. fertilizations, and these are genetically abnormal. The first situation can happen when there is contribution of only 23 chromosomes from the egg. In this case, the sperm is not contributing the chromosomes. And this would be a haploid fertilization. This usually happens after the intracytoplasmic sperm injection where 70% of the eggs are parthenogenetically activated. Next slide, please. 
This situation can happen when only the chromosomes from the sperm are contributing towards the formation of the 1PN. And again, these will be 23 chromosomes, and this will be abnormal uh, zygote. These haploid zygote, whether from female origin or from male origin, do not continue their development to the full term. Next slide, please. Now, what are causes of the 1PN? The first cause would be the spontaneous or induced oocyte activation, and it is called parthenogenetic activation. The eggs can be activated by simple prick of the ICSI needle. It can be activated by calcium ionophore, can be activated by the strontium chloride. There are some other chemicals, including even ethanol, that will cause artificial oocyte activation in the, in the eggs. The second condition is when the sperm chromatin fails to decondense, and this would be uh, the abnormal fertilization. Also, when all the chromosomes from the egg are segregated into the second polar body, again, this would be abnormal fertilization. A third polar body-like material has also been reported in the literature, which is uh, seen soon after the extrusion of the uh, second polar body, and those zygotes are abnormal as well. Now, the last point is very important for our routine um, embryology work. And these are the errors that can happen at the time of fertilization assessment. Either if we check too early fertilization or too late fertilization, we may not be getting the exact true estimate or observation of the fertilization. It has been reported that about 10% of the pronuclei disappear very early. The second cause could be, as I explained before, the overlapping of the pronuclei. So in that case, you will see that this is only one pronucleus. The third situation is when the polar body or any other structure is covering the pronucleus and it is not very clear whether this is 1PN or 2PN. You know, in our daily life, eggs are of different uh, qualities and sometimes there are inclusions inside, sometimes there are vacuoles, so many other strange uh, observations we have seen. So in those cases, it is not sometimes very clear to uh, decide whether this is 1PN or 2PN. Also, if the pronuclei are appearing at different times, usually they appear at the same time, but sometimes it has been reported that one pronucleus appears earlier than the other one. So in those cases, we usually check fertilization only once during the day, and if we miss that time, we will be calling those zygotes as 1PN. Also, at the same time, if the pronucleus is breaking down at different times, in those cases also, we may miss the 2PN situation. Sometime we have also uh, seen, it has been reported in the literature, that the sperm and egg chromosomes are enclosed in a single nuclear envelope. So in that case, there is no 2PN. There will be only one single pronucleus and we will be um, just calling it 1PN, whereas in reality, this zygote has 46 chromosomes. Next slide, please. So what is the cl clinical outcome from these 1PN zygotes? If these 1PNs are after the conventional in vitro fertilization or the egg insemination, 75% of those 1PNs are with normal chromosomal composition. However, in ICSI, the situation is reversed. Only 30% of the 1PNs are with the normal chromosomal composition as the needle uh, is activating those eggs artificially and those are not normal um, zygotes. The literature is supporting, and it has been reported that normal live births have been achieved after transfer of blastocysts obtained from the uh, 1PN zygotes. For example, in this study, which was done in 2019, 39 1PN blastocysts were transferred, 18 pregnancies were achieved, and 15 had heartbeat. 13 live births have been reported. But this was done in combination with the 
genetic testing of those embryos. There is another observation in the literature. They recommend that if the size of the one pronucleus is very, very small, it means this is haploid. Whereas it is larger or more than 30 micron meter in diameter, then usually it is uh, with the 46 chromosomes. But you know, in this era of genetic technology, we cannot rely on the morphology. Morphology is deceiving. And the chromosomal composition can only be determined by using the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Can you please move to the next slide? So these are my concluding statements regarding the 1PM zygotes. Time lapse is another tool which can help in getting the better image of the fertilization. If the labs have those uh, time lapse imaging technologies or microscope, this is very helpful. PGTA is recommended to confirm the diplody. In clinical setting or in those countries where there is no PGTA or no time lapse images, the literature is supporting to continue culture these 1PN zygotes to the blastocyst stage and transfer them, especially for those patients who have very few oocytes retrieved. However, I definitely recommend that if these patients get pregnant, the non-invasive um, prenatal testing is recommended to make sure that the uh, pregnancy is normal. In any case, the patient's informed consent is really required. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about these 3PN zygotes. These 3PN zygotes are way abnormal than what we talked regarding the 1PN. So there are situations when more than 46 chromosomes are included in the zygote. For example, in this situation, 46 chromosomes are contributed from the egg, and whereas only 23 are coming from the sperm. So altogether, there will be 69 chromosomes, and this situation would be X, X, and Y. Next slide, please. Similarly, uh, extra chromosomes can be contributed from the sperm, either if the sperm is abnormal with two sets of chromosomes, or there is fertilization by to sperm, then in that case, there will be more component from the sperm, and this individual would be 69 X, Y, Y. Next slide, please. Now, what are the causes of these 3PN? The first cause is the retention of the second polar body from the egg, and in that case, there will be extra chromosome from the egg. The second cause could be the injection or fertilization by abnormal sperm, which has uh, already diploid sperm composition. The third cause is by the fertilization of two sperm, or sometime uh, there could be more than two sperm for fertilization, and this is called polyspermy. This happens usually when the eggs are either very immature or they are post-mature. Some reports have suggested the high sperm concentration cause of polyspermia as well. However, in those cases, there is problem with the zona glucida and the cell membrane, which is allowing the penetration by more than one sperm. Also, there are formations of multiple nuclei around the si uh, site of second polar body exuion, and those multiple pronuclei embryos are not nor normal and they do not develop to the blastocyst stage. In some situation, a patient has repeatedly 3PNs. And in those cases, the report has shown that these are due to the genetic defects of that female. And several genes are involved in this situation. In those cases, of course, oocyte donor is a better option. In situations where male or female chromosome are organized in more than two nuclear components, like some embryologists call them fragmented pronuclei, most likely those would be uh, chromosomally normal, although they are uh, in appearance more than uh, two, but the chromosome set is uh, 46. Next slide, please. Can we correct this 3PN zygote? Yes, there are two conditions reported in the literature. The first procedure is to microsurgically correct the tri pronuclear situation. 
So microsurgically extra pronucleus is removed. There have been some documented reports and they have differentiated the male pronucleus or female pronucleus. The first case was reported in 1988. However, the live birth was obtained in 2003. The second situation could be where such 3PN zygotes correct themselves. And this may happen, of course it is rare. In those cases, the literature says that not all 3PNs are chromosomally abnormal and euploid blastoses have been observed in those cases. Next slide, please. What are the clinical considerations in our daily life? In my observation and experience, usually these 3PNs are discarded due to the fear of abnormal childbirth. We do not like any uh, abnormal baby. So usually those 3PNs are discarded. They can also grow to the blastocyst. About 11 to 63% can go to the blastocyst formation. And these triploid embryos can also result in spontaneous abortion. Some of those embryos with 3PN zygotes may have normal chromosomal composition, but majority of them are abnormal. So a case was reported uh, in which uh, the uh, euploid blastocyst was obtained from 3PNs and a healthy live birth was reported. And those cases are very rare. Next slide, please. So this is a study I like to share with you. This was done in uh, 2019. 30 3PN uh, blastocysts were analyzed. 10 of them, about one third was normal. How about 67% were abnormal? So this is very high percentage of abnormal uh, 3PNs. And among those abnormalities, 10% were due to aneuploidy. 43% due to triploidy and 13% because of mosaic conditions. Next slide, please. So what are my concluding statements regarding the 3PNs? The 3PN embryos may result in mosaic, trisomy, or abnormal births. So their transfer without confirmation of euploidy by PGTA is not recommended. Even if correction has been done by microsurgery, it has to be really tested by PGTA to see whether the chromosomal composition is normal because in some time, if the 2PN is fragmented and we are taking some of the chromosomes out, the remaining embryo will not be chromosomally normal. But in situations where there is no euploid blastocyst after ICSI, the 3PN blastocyst can be transferred, but only after testing with the PGTA. In all those cases, informed consent of the recipient is mandatory. The time-lapse imaging may help us in determination of the detailed events on the fertilization. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for listening. I really enjoyed today talking to you and all the best to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marit. Uh, now our next speaker is Bill Vinier. Bill, thank you so much. Thank you, Nabil. And thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm uh, very good, Marit. Uh, that was very in-depth. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit simpler than that. I'm going to kind of give you kind of our background here at, at uh, San Diego Fertility Center and uh, what we're doing with these types of uh, uh, embryos that derive from, from 1PNs and, and so forth and so on. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this paper kind of set it all for us back in uh, 2017. Uh, this is a, uh, some groups from Italy and then RMA here in the US. Uh, you know, did this is very limited. The numbers are small, but uh, they gave insight on um, 1PNs and what most people call 3PNs are um, symmetrical pronuclei. Um, they break it down into uh, 2.1 PNs. So uh, two symmetrical PNs and then kind of a micro PN off to the side. Um, I don't see much of those, 
we do see, I probably see about a handful a year for those 2.1 PN uh, zygotes, but uh, I probably see a handful uh, almost every week of 1 PNs. So um, yeah, that kind of changed our philosophy of uh, uh, keeping those. Um, we do not keep 3 PNs, symmetrical 3 PNs at all uh, at this point. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, and, and in that paper, 70% uh, of 1 PNs are diploid and almost 86% of um, those 2.1 PNs were diploid. So the bottom line uh, is do not discard these types of zygotes. Um, uh, they are usable, as we can tell, uh, as long as we counsel the patients uh, accordingly and they're accepting of this. Uh, and like Marit uh, referred to, uh, you know, they need a special consent knowing that they're getting this type of, of zygote uh, turned to a uh, beautiful embryo transplant. The big question is, what do we do with untested? So if we're not doing PGTA for people, what should we do with the untested uh, 1PNs? Um, so that, that's a dilemma that, uh, you know, we need to cross um, uh, with the patients themselves. The problem with this um, uh, alt altogether is we do not, uh, we don't really have... Um, pregnancy data on these, uh, since we haven't really uh, done it for long. Uh, we have tested 1PNs. We are a 100% ICSI program. Um, the 1PNs that have made it to blastocyst um, and have made it to PGTA, I would say is um, a dozen. Out of those dozen, 11 have come back to one and that's with ICSI. So that so it's a little bit uh, opposite of what Morid um, showed on his slide. And um, we also have to do that, the testing for zero PNs. So we do see zero PNs that grow to beautiful blastocysts. You know, if we miss um, fertilization uh, or seeing the pronuclei at check, uh, sometimes we do. So those are definitely worth keeping as well. And again, if they're good enough and that's all they have, whether they're tested or untested, the patient is counseled correctly and consented correctly, um, this should be used. Uh, next slide. All right, I have a little bit more data uh, really regarding mosaics and abnormal embryos uh, because we have transferred them uh, in our program. And um, for the most part, uh, anything that is totally abnormal has not led to a live birth for us yet. Uh, we do have one currently um, that is uh, ongoing, but it is early. So I, I'm not expecting that one to go to go on, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll be surprised. However, mosaics, both low and high, have led to uh, healthy babies. So next slide. Um, so our philosophy in the past was, um, anything PGTA tested, that was normal, was of course safe, anything abnormal. And at that time, we did not want to know if they were mosaic. We did not want that call. We just wanted normal versus euploid. Um, so anything that was deemed abnormal, we discarded and we discarded right away. We did not save them in storage or anything along those lines. Um, however, we have switched gears on that uh, 100%. We save everything, whether it's mosaic, high, low, or abnormal, we're going to save it. Um, hopefully, we don't need to use these types of embryos, but they're there just in case. And uh, next slide. And this is why. We've done 26 transfers with just abnormal or mosaic embryos. We have had, we've done additional with a mix of normal and abnormal, but I've took them out of here. 
So 26 transfers with, with 29 embryos. We have 13 positives that are ongoing or delivered. So some of these positives, um, three have delivered, two have resulted in uh, a set of twins. And then we have four that are due this month, actually, this month or next month. Um, and, and the rest are, are early on. But um, for the most part, you know, that's a 50% positive rate. And if we put in the five biochemical and SABs that occurred from these, that's almost a 70% positive rate with transfers. Um, and if we, uh, you know, include those five, uh, that's uh, somewhere in the high teens as far as uh, loss. So it's a little bit higher than what we see with euploid embryos, of course, that should be expected. Um, but out of the 11 embryos uh, that were transferred uh, prior to 2020, prior to um, uh, the patients that could have a live birth, those 11 embryos resulted in five healthy babies. So these are something that need to be considered, need to be saved. They don't necessarily have to be used at first, but for Patients at their, at their end of the rope, or this is all they give you, uh, again, that's a conversation that needs to be had with the physicians and their patients, as well as the genetic counselor, of course. Um, but for the most part, we're seeing, you know, positive outcomes coming from these types of embryos. So I was uh, pretty brief um, on my little, my presentation here, but I just wanted to give you out of our data of what's going on. And uh, I'm very thankful again that Nabil asked me because I think I'm probably one of the one of the people that have asked for this type of presentation to go on for this type of webinar. So thanks. I think that's my last slide. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bill. Um, our next uh, speaker is Yimin Shu. Hi everyone, it's my uh, great pleasure to have this opportunity to share my thoughts and the, of the data with everyone. Thanks, Nabi, for um, uh, allowing me to um, uh, this opportunity to um, to be here with everyone today. Uh, let's start, please. So, um, today's presentation, I just talk a little bit about the fate and the outcome of abnormally fertilized embryos, uh, mostly like one pn and three pn. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, abnormally fertilized uh, embryos happen, you know, very often. Um, you know, the percentage uh, is about around five percent. So, this uh, I want to use this figure to um, show everyone there was a very wide range of the prolific formation and also the uh, prolific disappearance. As you can see from the um, the left figure. Um, the prolific um, appearance could happen as early as six hours, and then you know around like twelve to eighteen hours. That's a peak time. After twenty hours uh, post insemination, some of the uh, fertilized egg are going to divide. And on the left slide, uh, figure, you can see that you know, twenty hours, um, some of the Fertilized egg become two cells, and 22 hours, 24 hours, around 30 hours, you know, that's a big time. So it's it's a very wide range. That's why sometimes uh, we only saw one prolucleia. Uh, we might see three prolucleia. Um, basically, uh, there are some limitations um, from the conventional observation. Um, on the next slide, we're going to talk about, you know, time lapse. Thank you. Next slide, please. So this is a data. Um, so last slide is a small sample size study. Uh, this is a, um, a larger sample size study we just uh, performed recently. So we had around like 900 PNs. So we observed the um, timing uh, of the uh, prolific appearance. As you can see from here, around four hours, 13% uh, of the uh, eggs receiving ICSI uh, showed very faint PN. And then, around like five hours, 
So, uh, so seventy-five percent of them has uh, have at least one the uh, the prolucrian around like six to seven hours. Ninety-five percent of them have you know prolucrian already. Um, around nine hours, there will be no more uh, new prolucrian formation. So basically, it's a, it's a very wide range. So that's why you know sometimes we miss the window. Yeah. Next slide, please. Okay. So um, this is a study performed um, invest to investigate the uh, parental arranging of the chromatin of the abnormal fertilized embryos. So basically, it really depends how we fertilize it. Um, the IVF and ICSI are different. So basically for the 1 p.m. from the RVF, mostly it's because of fusion of parental chromatin. Um, but for ICSI, uh, it's because of uniparental chromatin. So which means most of the time, you know, the 1 p.m. from ICSI might not be usable. And for the 3 p.m., uh, for the conventional insemination, uh, mostly because of a two sperm fertilized with, with one egg. And for ICSI, uh, that, that's due to the failure of the Extrusion of the second polar body. So, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So basically, because the conventional um, microscope observation, we only have very limited time points to observe the uh, periodic formation. And uh, so basically, um, the time lapse allows a lot of op uh, opportunity to observe. Uh, some of the you know events we might miss during the uh, conventional insemination. The first advantage of the time lapse monitoring is a lot repeated observation of the prolucrian status. So we can go back to see you know when it happens and what really happens because uh, sometimes you know there might be um, some changes between the nuclear number. For example, uh, some of the uh, two prolucria might become three because one of the prolucrian might be broken or maybe divided into, 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 into two. And sometimes, you know, 3 p.m. might be merging and to the 2 p.m. So this allows us uh, to have um, a more um, accurate observation about, you know, the uh, formation of the prolucrian and also the number of the prolucrian. And also um, it helps us to identify the size of the prolucrian. Some of them small, some of them larger, so that gives us more information. Yeah, next slide, please. I think uh, Marika has already shown everyone about, you know, the, um, or oh, this is the, um, uh, the development potential of the abnormal fertilized embryos. So basically uh, you can see from here, um, the 2 p.m. for me, uh, the blastocyst formation is around 61%, but the MPN is the more low p.m., so 1 p.m., so mostly, it's a 17% of them uh, reach the blastocyst stage. And multiple PN um, zygotes, 42% uh, of them reach the blastocyst stage. So generally speaking, you know, the two PN are doing better uh, in making blastocysts as compared to the uh, MPN and multiple PN. And also this uh, interesting from this study, the multiple PN are doing better than the, the, uh, the um, uh, molar PN. Next slide, please. Um, another question, we know that some of the abnormally fertilized embryos can still make a blastocyst. Um, are they normal? Uh, are they usable? So I want to borrow this slide to show um, uh, what's the, uh, you know, the plurality status. Uh, the rate of deployed chromosomes in one pn zygotes uh, were 86% in RVF, only 30% for ICSI. So that's for the one pn And on the table, uh, for the um, 3 p.m. embryos, um, this is slide that Maury already showed. So 30%, 33% of them are uh, euploid, and 67% are uh, adeuploid. So which means some of them could still be norm, uh, euploid. Um, but, you know, if we just use the NGS, unfortunately, we might not be able to tell if, you know, this euploid from one from female, one from male. But if you you sleep, uh, that can tell you the parental origin. And uh, it, it it is possible that you know this um, euploid might be from uh, person genetic activation. 
or from androgenetic activation. So, so that's something, you know, NGS might not be doing better as a slave. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. So basically, there have been several um, published reports showing, uh, you know, the lab birds from the uh, following the trends of the 1 p.m. or no 0 p.m. embryos. And so far, there's only one lab birth report after transfer of an euploid blast cells from the 3 p.m. embryos. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is the one um, lab birth, only lab birth at this moment, you know, following the transfer of the 3 p.m. embryo, it's uh, from a turkey group. Okay. Next slide, please. So basically, um, uh, so we know that there are three PNs, uh, there are three sets of chromosomes. Uh, why do they, uh, you know, why are they become euploid? Um, the exact mechanism is under investigation. So at this moment, uh, there are two theories. The first series is that the human embryos have the ability to do self-correction. So the first mechanism is through excluding the abnormal cells, uh, but you know the cell debris or fragmentation. So in other words, there are two groups of cells in the same embryo. The abnormal embryos was excluded from the uh, blast cyst loop. The remaining uh, healthy cells, uh, they will become uh, normal embryos with uh, euploid embryos. That's one theory you can see from here. So basically we collapse this blast cyst and then under the zona, there are two, uh, you know, cells, a cell-like structure. Basically, they are based on the size. They're probably between six, eight to sixteen cell stage. Yeah, because they, uh, you know, the complete space uh, between the uh, arrest cells and the blastocyst cavity. So basically, these cells were crushed under uh, the zona pellucida. The another theory of a self correction is that you know the chromosome abnormal embryos might undergo apoptos apoptosis. But there's no direct evidence um, to say you know which one is 100% right. My understanding is that you know there might be several mechanisms involved in this process. Yeah, next slide, please. So basically, uh, this slide I just want to uh, show um, that you know the um, as you can see from these figures. Uh, basically, uh, this is a blast cyst. It, it's a complete hatchet. And so on the zona, in the zona, there are several wrong cells. Uh, those cells actually are, you know, um, arrest cells. So we don't know if it's normal or abnormal, but, you know, they didn't continue to grow and they failed to join the, um, the blast cyst. So um, this study um, performed, um, I think the recent study, I'm sorry, I didn't include the reference. So basically they did a test um, on both the trophectinal cells and the arrest cells. Um, they had 11 pairs, uh, seven pairs, the result are discordant, which means for sure they are, they are either totally eluploid or mosaic. And we, um, in our lab, so we, uh, did, we test 13 um, arrest cells with you know, the relevant blast cyst, all of them are normal. So basically, um, and this group, they test, um, um, they had nine euploid blast cyst. Uh, four of them showed uh, euploid debris, and the five of them were uh, euploid. So most of the time, I would like to say, you know, they were not the same, um, you know, uh, uh, a chromosome constitution. Um, at least they are mosaic, mosaic embryos. Uh, some of them, you know, they might be um, um, euploid in both trophectin cells and the arrest cell, but most of them, you know, the arrest cells, which was, um, which were excluded um, by the uh, blast cyst or uh, adeploid. Next slide, please. Yeah, so basically, um, um, so we actually performed the transfer of the uh, blast cyst from the uh, one pn embryos. And um, by each lab, I would like to say, um, uh, should make their own decision on whether to discard or continue culture these uh, abnormally fertilized embryos. So based on the PGS test, so abnormal fertilized embryos could be deployed 
uh, through self-correction so that they can um, be used for transfer. Uh, live births have been obtained from transfer uh, both 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. embryos. Um, PGTA is very uh, strongly recommended to detect the employed status of the blast cells that divide from uh, the abnormal fertilized oocyte. So um, we have never transferred any 3 pn without doing the test. And I learned a lot from the first two speakers. So basically it, it is important for the patient to receive a genetic counselor um, before they make any decision of a transfer. Um, you know, they employ the embryos from either 1 pn or 3, uh, 3 pn embryos. And also, um, I totally agree with that, you know, um, I informed consent is mandatory so that the patient is fully uh, instructed and that they're aware of any like potential uh, risk that we don't know at this moment. Yeah, this is the last slide. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Yimin. Um Our next speaker is Beck Holmes. Beck, thank you so much for joining us. Hi there, thanks for having me. Um, so I wanted to talk about CCR'd experience with 1 p.m., 0 p.m. and 3 p.m. Um, if you could go to the first slide, please. And then the next, thank you. I wanted to talk more on a practical term in terms of what we do in the lab um, for these embryos. So definitely at CCRM, the majority of our patients are using PGTA. So in the case of the 0, 1, and 3 pms that makes life a little what they're doing at least genetically and i would say at least over 99 percent of our patients undergo ICSI. so we can't say we're 100 percent ICSI, but we're almost there um so what happens at cert check is that we'll keep these abnormal embryos or abnormal FERPs are kept in separate drops so we do group culture from all of our embryos um, but at first check, we will sequester those abnormals and we'll put them in separate drops and you know label the drops appropriately. And then we'll freeze or biopsy and freeze any of these that form a good quality blast. It's generally using the garden scale of BB or better. Um, and then next slide, please. If an embryo um, is... Um, uh, sorry, once we test the en embryo with PGTA, if it comes back as normal, euploid or correct, whatever terminology you use, and it's from an abnormal FERT, these are reflexed for SNP analysis to determine parental origin of the genomes. Um, zero PNs don't get reflexed if they're XY, so we know that the uh, Y chromosome, the sperm has gotten in there. Um, biopsy samples for us at CCM will go to our internal genetics lab, CCM Genetics, and the abnormal PM PN status of embryos, um, we communicate this to our genetics lab um, via our biopsy worksheet. So we'll note on the biopsy worksheet whether or not these are um, abnormal um, first so that they can um, reset them as appropriate if need be. Next slide, please. So we don't have a huge no amount of data, but um, I did want to share what we do have. So in the last year, um, from this is data gathered, gathered from four of our sites. Um, we've biopsied around 81 0 pn embryos, and around half of them are coming back as euploid. For our 1 pns, we've biopsied around 30, and we have a 27% normal rate for the 1 pns. And for the 3 pns, it's a much lower normal rate, so those are coming back at around 5%. Um, next slide, please. And then even more limited data on pregnancy. We have done some um, zero PN um, uh, transfers. Um, we have implantation for all of those with two of the three ongoing. And one of those actually comes from a second day ICSI. And then for one PNs, we've only done one thus far, and that, that is an ongoing pregnancy. So next slide, please. So I think the important things to um, think about here is why we're doing this. Um, so I think for most of us, it's as well as um, intellectual curiosity 
the main reason is to maximize the number of embryos for patients. And we do this in many ways um, at CCRM, particularly where we're doing day, we're going to day seven culture. And we have a lot of pregnancies from day seven embryos. And we'll do second day ICSI on patients that qualify if they've had a low FERT rate on day one or a low maturity rate. So all of this is to sort of increase the reproductive potential of our patients. Um, and I think that's worth bearing in mind and fully um, agree with what Bill was saying is that we're doing this um, to create more em embryos and with what's best for the patient. But as with all the speakers here, I will agree that we do all have limited data. Um, we do know that these have decreased reproductive potential and you know, that being said, we will, you know, we'll test these embryos and if they come back normal, we're happy to use them in a transfer. But generally, it's our last resort. So the patient has gone um, through their cohort of re um, normally specialized euploid embryos, which is probably one of the reasons why we have such limited data, because we're just not getting to um, getting down to these lower ranked embryos. Uh, they're definitely deprioritized when it comes to what we're going to choose for embryos. Um, we don't have a huge amount of data, I think, um, in general, about how many of these what, um, abnormal FERTs are creating blastocysts. And then, you know, even then, the data is even more limited when it comes to the ploidy status of these. Um, so I think it's worth bearing in mind um, that we, you know, we need to I think it's good that we're all doing this and continue doing this and pooling our data so that we can really maximize um, patient experience and um, take home baby rate. And I think that's my last slide. Check. Thank you so much. Okay, so we asked the audience a few questions on the um, uh, their policy of um, um, 3 p.m. 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. So the first question was, what's your rate of 1 p.m. and 3 p.m.? And uh, uh, we asked, we gave a, a breakdown of uh, 0 to 2 percent, 2 to 5, 5 to 10, over 10. It looks like the uh, majority, about um, 40 percent, voted 2 to 5 percent to be the most representative number of 1 p.m. and 3 p.m followed by 30%, so somewhere between 30% and 40%. And uh, our second question is, what is your mosaicism rate? And 28% um, uh, mentioned 1 to 3%, 20% 3 to 5%, and 16% uh, of the responses uh, said it would be 5 to 10%. And 7% of the responses said there is a 10 to 20% mosaicism rate. This is the distribution of mosaicism rate um, in, uh, in, our, uh, in all our attendees. And um, we have about 100 uh, attendee as we speak. Third question is, uh, do you uh, PGTA test 1 p.m. and 3 p.m.? And so it is a split decision. 47% do testing, PGTA testing, 53% don't. Then we ask, do you transfer 1 p.m. and 3 p.m.? 33% said yes, very surprising. 67% um, said no. Then we ask, how often 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. embryos result in normal pregnancy or deliveries? And 42% says rarely. 0% um, says often, and 12% says never, and 47% don't transfer. So basically about half said that occasionally they have uh, a positive outcome. Then we ask, do you transfer mosaic embryos? Again, 50-50%, 49% uh, yes, 51% no, and how often mosaic embryo result in normal pregnancies or deliveries 19 percent says very often 40 percent said rarely and 40 percent they don't have an answer for that uh, they don't transfer mosaic embryos and now let's take the feedback from uh from our panel and i'll start with you maybe bill you can tell us 
what do you think about the poll results? Is it surprising? Were you surprised? Um, not necessarily. Um, again, uh, ever since we, we get into this or um, from the beginning, I mean, we're learning stuff every day. So it's just, uh, it's hard to um, uh, start something, get into something without the data behind it, of course. Uh, that's probably the best way to do things. So a lot of people hold back um, from doing things, but uh, others are on the, uh, on the forefront, uh, you know, uh, cutting down the frontier for us and uh, doing these types of things. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's both sides of the fence, which uh, I expect. And, uh, you know, more and more people are going to start doing it. it it's it's um, education like this webinar and, uh, and reading, you know, papers and conferences and all that type of stuff uh, to get us to, to see a, a bigger picture of things. So just because... Uh, in the past, we thought something was uh, not usable whatsoever and wouldn't even think about using it. Nowadays, you know, we're considering, hey, this, this has potential, you know, we shouldn't be discarding it, so. Awesome. Um, Beck, what do you think? Very much in agreement. So not surprised that it's, that a lot of people are still not transferring these. I think it's, you know, it's, it's, a new frontier for us. It, this is probably just the beginning. Um, I hope that this is uh, persuading people that it's, it's something that we need to look at and hold on to these embryos at least until we know we have more data on what they're doing. Um, I think also we need to bear in mind that a lot of people are probably hesitant to not do these transfers because maybe they're not using PGTA technology on these embryos. So, you know, it's hard to put back a abnormally fertilized embryo if we don't know the genetic status of it so i think i think probably some of the audience or some of the some of the poll is coming from that of not using pgta fantastic uh Muri? yes i think i agree with uh, what beck said uh, it is uh, i have seen some embryologists in my life whenever they see three pns for sure, they do not even like to put this in the dish. So they are not, uh, they are not comfortable in continuing those. Awesome. And I think with new technologies, and if we are uh, in our clinic, uh, we are getting more and more uh, patients who are 40 years, 42 years, even 44, 46 years. In those cases, I think we have to try our best to make use of any single embryo that we get in the lab whether it shows 1 p.m. or 3 p.m. Um, many labs are now coming up to have the time-lapse system in their labs. So I think that will help. Otherwise, I think now PGTA, uh, the genetic technology testing or genetic testing is available. I think those tools are there to maximize use of uh, any embryo that we get from those patients who produce only few number of eggs. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Yamin, uh, what is your feedback on the poll? You're muted. Um, I agree with the poor. So basically, um, the rate of the, you know, like uh, abnormal fertilization. Um, and also, um, I totally agree with, uh, you know, that uh, 1 p.m. or maybe 0 p.m. Uh, transfer this type of the, you know, uh, abnormally fertilized embryos are more acceptable as compared to 3 p.m. because the 3 p.m. we have more concerns. Yeah, so basically, um, um, so even before we had PGS, you know, um, we, we transferred 1 p.m. probably 13 years ago. Uh, we had a lot of births from there, but you know, these days the technology has been improved a lot. So basically it helps a lot. So firstly understand what happens, you know, about the physiology. The secondly, it gives us more evidence before we make any decision. So I think that's, you know, for especially for some of the patient who is old and who doesn't have that many embryos, if they have 10 blast cysts, I don't think we're going to use any of them. So uh, usually we don't, we 
we keep the abnormal fertilized eggs of, of in a different dish from the normal ones. So, but we will not going to discard anything until day six. So we keep everything just in case, because for example, if the patient doesn't have good blast cells from the 2 p.m., or maybe she doesn't have any normal ones, but she happened to have uh, have one euploid embryos from you know the abnormal fertilized embryos. So I think at that moment probably you know that's an indication, um, you know, for this type of uh, patient with a special indication. And another uh, point that I probably um, um, recommend is when we send the blast cyst for PGTA, uh, the euploid embryo doesn't necessarily mean it's normal. Euploid just means you know two sets of chromosomes. Unfortunately, it could be from from two uh, parents or maybe from sperm only or from egg only. So if so that if you know so because of this, I think uh, I would recommend the uh, we when we send these type of embryos, uh, you know you can request a, a parent of origin testing. I know Kubo Genomics. They always if you do if you have a special request, they're going to do that for you. But Natara because they are used slave, they can always provide this information. But what about your testing system, Nabia? Are you going to do that? Uh, you know the parent of uh, origin. Testing? Yeah, I, I was I was going to talk about that in a minute. Um, oh, okay. But, but uh, yeah, it'll be it had, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah we're oh, also interested in your parents of origin testing. Yeah, yeah no, exactly, exactly. Um, so um, this is a, uh, in connection with one of the questions we got on the chat, and I I will respond to your question at the same time. Uh, the question was uh, how. Uh, um, and this is from, uh, it was from James Schwartz. He said, I thought that NGS cannot distinguish between 2PN and 3PN. Um, so it, it was in reference of, uh, reference to the comments that you guys made when you say, okay, you test. If you're not sure, test, PGTA testing. Uh, do you guys want to comment? I, I, I have a comment about it as well. You're probably the best. Uh, yes. To, okay. To so let me comment on that. So yeah. it a uh, the, the distinction between trisomy and triploidy. Trisomy is only one chromosome, um, uh, three copies of one particular chromosome, and triploidy is a triplicate of chromosomes. So uh, most of the time, when you have a triploidy uh, of a female XXX. That is uh, difficult to uh, distinguish with uh, with the current PGTA platform, but there are other forms of triploidies. That are the the sixty um, the sixty nine X X Y and X Y Y. Those situations you can detect detect uh, easily with with uh, with PGTA platforms because you don't have the same chromosomes you have. A three copy of autosomal chromosome, and then you have two copies of X and one copy of Y is like a letter, so you can easily detect that. Uh, or you have three copies of autosomal, and for X, Y, Y, you have two copies of Y and one copy of X, so that you can detect. But on the tri on the 69 XXX, you get a one line of all the um, of the autosomal and, and chromosome and X chromosome. So 66% of those cases are detectable. 33 depends on what platform you're using. I hope I have answered your question, uh, uh, Yimin, about the uh, detection. And uh, yeah, no problem. Um, what if I, I would like to ask you guys, what do you think the rate of 1PN and 3PN in your embryo population? And is it age related? I'll start with you, Bill. Um, I would say it's somewhat age related. Um, I haven't really delved uh, that deep into it. Um, I could just, um, uh, I was gonna bring up mosaics because um, the majority of uh, the data I showed um, over half of those patients um, are 39 or older. Now there's a couple of EDRs in there as well. Um, but as far as the 1PN, 3PN, 
I would say the percentage um, is probably, I would say less than five. It's probably three to 4% in our lab, um, but we do so much. I actually do see a lot um, every week. Uh, so, you know, it, it's good that we're testing these and um, that we're getting uh, uh, the majority of the results, again, have come back positive for us for those 1 PMs. And again, we're not going to use them. They're, I mean, they're our last resort as far as using them. Uh, same as zero PMs, even though we get, uh, you know, the verification that they're okay, that they're, they're deployed, they still won't be our first choice, even if the, 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 unless the grading is just drastically different, we're not gonna to touch them. Um, but yeah, I would say it's about four or 5% kind of to answer your question. And that is in line with what we get from the, uh, from the poll, uh, two to 5%, 39% of the audience said it, it is within that range. Uh, Beck, what is the rate in your uh, clinic? Probably about the same. I think I think we see tend to see more one pm than we do three pm. Um, I don't know if that's the patient population that we see, but definitely more one pm in the older population. That's probably something, obviously, to do with the egg and the aging egg. Um, but probably around three, three to five percent, near, maybe nearer five percent for um, for one pm. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Back, I would say. Our 3 p.m. rate again with ICSI um, is less than less than one percent. So mm, agree, yeah. It's very rare. Yeah, the one p.m. that we see. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so one p one one p.m. is uh, more common than 3 p.m. How about you, Marid? What do you see in your lab? Uh, in our program, we are 100 percent ICSI. Uh, we are not doing any conventional insemination. And I have very rarely seen 3 PNs. Uh, 1 PN I see sometimes, uh, but the percentage to me would be about 3% of 1 PNs and maybe less than 1% for 3 PN. Regarding this uh, effect of age and stimulation, when I was reviewing the literature, almost 99% of the reports were saying that the age is not affecting the rate of ploidy, it could be the inherent uh, abilities of the eggs, but there was only one study that said that age and the stimulation are affecting. So I do not know uh, the literature, majority of the reports are saying that it is not affected by the uh, stimulation protocols or age of the patient, but one report said it could be. So I think majority you can probably go with the majority that uh, 1 p.m. or 3 p.m. And usually, you know, those 3 p.m. are in cases of conventional uh, egg insemination or the um, conventional in vitro fertilization, where polyspermy is a uh, kind of uh, reason for uh, 3 p.m. In ICSI, I have very rarely seen 3 p.m., very rarely. Very good. How about you, Yemen? Do you have the same experience? Um, actually, uh, the 3 p.m., I think my, my personal observation is happens more often uh, in aged patient. So it's, a, it's probably 2 to 3 percent, it's absolutely less than 5 percent. Um, but 1 p.m., I do not see, you know, there's a significant difference among different patients' ages. Um, but um, I do realize, you know, sometimes when we do ICSI, you know, if, you know, when you forward the ICSI leader to the zonal, when there's very little defense from the membrane, so those kind of eggs, it's really hard to handle because, you know, you don't want to do a second injection, but, you know, if there's no defense, you know, it has a little bit higher chance to have 1 p.m. And also I observed that some, um, uh, when we use a frozen donor egg, you know, those eggs, some of them are super, and some of them, you know, the membrane probably not very resistant, you know, if for those eggs, I do realize, you know, they, has, um, they have high chance to have 1 p.m. But, you know, the general uh, rate of the 1 p.m. Is, is still less than 5%, I think probably around 2%, yeah. But for this special group, you know, those eggs has less defense uh, 
a membrane has less defense, you know, they, uh, I, I, my experience, you know, of a data uh, that's show, you know, they have more uh, chance to, to be one PN. Yeah, thank you. And that's <laughs> an idea. Yeah. Um, different. I think there is an echo, someone is using the speakers maybe. Okay, so um, my question is ICSI versus IVF, do you think, um, I I is it possible that uh, ICSI lets less um, 1PN and 3PN or is, or the data, there is no data? And I can take any answer from, from, from the panel, ICSI versus IVF. Well, Nabil, can I? On IVF. Yes, Buri. Uh, I um, do not have data, but if we look into the theoretical um, benefits, there was a time, of course, including me, we were doing majority of those cases with um, conventional fertilization. But now over years, the trend has changed for me, including my philosophy has changed. Like in conventional IVF, you end up with some of them with multiple PNs, triploidy, multiple uh, sperm insemination. And there are also some of the eggs which would not be even fertilized. So the patient satisfaction is compromised. The patients coming to us are usually very old and not too many eggs. If the causes of infertility are the tubal ligation, for sure, IVF would be the number one choice. But in those cases who are more than 40 years, in those cases, number one, the eggs are limited. And number two, uh, ICSI would at least make sure that one sperm is deposited properly into the egg. And number two, we make sure that what quality of the eggs we are dealing with. So uh, I think those uh, reasons have uh, led us to practice almost all ICSI. Now I see the differences between the pronuclei of the uh, conventional insemination. They are usually very big size and ICSI are usually smaller. Uh, but you know, ultimately we are answerable to the patients. When it comes to the pregnancy rate, uh, the difference is not there. Probably both are giving approximately the same pregnancy date. But when it comes to the patient's satisfaction or the physician has to answer, or the umbrella just has to answer the physician, if we say no fertilization, then that is a very difficult situation to defend for umbrella just as well as for the uh, physician to the patient. Yeah. So I think normally we are now convinced that since ICSI has no are there are not higher chances of abnormalities coming from the ICSI. If the sperm is okay, if there are no genetic problems, then ICSI is probably the more dependable technology uh, in these days. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, one question came to the chat from uh, uh, Rahil. Uh, he was saying that, uh, you know, obviously uh, consent form play a major role in this decision-making process of transferring embryos that are 1PN, 3PN. But he emphasized the role of SARS, ASRM, and ESHRA guidelines. Do, do we, he says there are no guidelines. What do you guys think? No guidelines so far on transferring 1PN, 3PN? Or do you guys are aware of anything that, that we should uh, uh, you know, inform the embryologists in this uh, webinar? Uh, uh, Nabil, can I say something on this? Uh, yeah, I'm of sorry course. to interrupt this. Yeah, no, uh, I was reading the literature. You know, ASHRAE guidelines very clearly state do not transfer 1PN and 3PN. It says very clearly. But, you know, based on the uh, need of the patient and because of the uh, scientific advancement of the reality, of course, we have to uh, satisfy the patients as well. So if those embryos come in from 1PN or euploid, this is an extra uh, advantage for the patients to go. So in those cases, uh, I think we are probably forced to, uh, to lean towards the utilization of those eggs because these are the people who may not have this opportunity in their future. So if they yeah. have euploid embryos from 1PN, then I would, uh, 
course, uh, uh, like to use them. But SA guidelines very clearly states, do not transfer 1PN or 3PN. Yeah, and I think, Rahil, I, I misread his, uh, his uh, um, message. I think he said that it falls under ESHRA guidelines, but he said it would be nice to see uh, the policy of SARTS or statements from SARS and ASRM. What do you yeah. guys think? Well, I think more more it hit it on the head. Uh, this is driven by the patients. This isn't driven by our industry, so to speak. This is driven by uh, not our star patients. This is their last resort. This is you know they're at the end of their rope, um, and they want any hope that's possible. You know, it could be one percent. It could be three percent. It could be ten. Whatever it is, they're going to grasp onto that. Whatever that low percentage is, there's still a chance. So they want to take that chance. And who are we to say, you know, we can't. If it comes back, you know, normal or whatever, deployed. Um, you know, we, we see patients, uh, as, as all of you do, that are at the end of their rope and they will try anything. And as long as they're consented to counsel, you know, uh, who are we to say they can't? And uh, it may come to a court case someday where, you know, whether it's ESHA or ASRM says we can't use them, I doubt they'll ever come to that. But a patient may sue and say, that's all I got. So, you know, I just think this is patient driven. And yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, Vic, Vic, what is your stand on this? Do you think, uh, um, uh, you know, ASRM should uh, be part of this policy making process or is it something as bill was saying it's it's a relationship between the patient and and the physician it's the patient's decision ultimately what do you think i think it's definitely patient driven i mean these are their embryos after all we can make our recommendations um and as long as we document and counsel them and give them the appropriate consent I think we can go ahead with the transfer. I think ASRM would be unwilling to make a stance right now um, until we have more data. So I think as with anything in our field, we're very data driven. So once we have more data um, and more outcomes to back up um, the data, then there may be a stance we've made, but right now I, I can't see them doing that right now. Okay. Um, any other comments, Yemen? Do you, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, I would like to say it really depends on you know the settings of each clinic. Some of the clinic, the embryologists had a lot of conversation or communication with the patient, and some of the clinic, the embryologist doesn't join at all. So it, it is mostly driven by the physician, and also I, you know. To be honest, I think the physician pay more attention about these liability issues, so that you know they really think a little bit more um, about you know this you know potential risk or maybe potential liability. Um, I agree with everyone that you know there's very little data at this moment. Um, it's hard to predict you know what's the uh, you know the policy potential policy future policy from ASM because if you don't have data, they don't have they cannot make any recommendation. Uh, even they have recommendation, recommendation is recommendation. You know, you can still do the transfer, even they recommend you not to do the transfer. And also, you know, basically, you know, most of the time I would like to say, you know, if the patient went to the step of considering transferring, you know, abnormally fertilized embryos, so, which means they do not have any other solutions, that's the last um, solution for them. So for sure. You know they they don't want to give up that easily, so it is um, a hot decision. Yeah. So. Exactly, and we have uh, a question from uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, I think we have um, we have a question from the DT. Um, any study on the level of mosaicism out of one pn? Have you seen any difference with high level and low level of uh, mosaicism, uh, um, mosaic embryos? Any differences in the outcome? I think we have touched a little bit about the outcome, and but we have not put the level of mosaicism in that context. And you, Bill, you did have some data on transferring mosaic embryos. 
have you looked at low versus high mosaic and are there any differences? Let me see, I can do it real quick. I don't think, I just think it's more low. There's a, a better chance with low than high. I would say the majority of our pregnancies are low. Um, we do have a, a set of twins where it was one low and one high. And we also have a set of twins with two highs. So, um, but the ongoing pregnancies right now are mostly low, low mosaics, but highs cause it. I mean, cause pregnancies as well. So don't count them out. And all these mosaic embryos were 2 p.m., correct? You don't look at 1 and 3 p.m. in that equation. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Yep, okay, just two no. PNs, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Uh, Beck, what's your data look like when it comes to transferring mosaic embryo? Do you guys transfer mosaic? Uh, we're currently doing studies, so we don't have any data uh, that's published yet, but we are we are in that arena um, on looking at the data. We don't have anything to, to publish yet. Awesome. Uh, Murid, any... any uh, uh, no, I cannot add much into this, but I would like to add one point to the previous um, discussion regarding the um, pregnancy from the 1PNs. You know, in this uh, technology age, there is uh, non-invasive prenatal testing. So even if we transfer those uh, 1PN embryos, uh, there is another defense line when we can take the blood from that uh, female and send for uh, non-invasive prenatal testing. And that would be another secondary line of defense before any abnormal baby is born. Absolutely. Uh, Yemen, do you guys look at, uh, do you have any data you would like to share on mosaicism? Sure. Uh, yeah, we do transfer uh, mosaic embryo, uh, but the big, not the big number as bad, okay? So basically, um, uh, it, you know, it's, it really depends what's the, what's the situation of mosaic. Uh, we do transfer high mosaic, unfortunately, there were two pregnancies. Um, uh, one of them was biochemical and the other one still ongoing. So that's to our surprise because that's the last one the patient has. So basically, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the baby has not been delivered yet. But for the low level mosaic, um, it really depends on which chromosome. Uh, the major chromosomes like XY, 13, 18, you know, 21, we should not consider those embryos. Um, but, you know, for those patients, uh, you know, those uh, low level, segmental low level, for sure, you know, we feel very confident to do the transfer because um, there was a published paper showing that, you know, low level mosaic with a segmental, uh, you know, mosaic, you know, uh, could uh, eat uh, similar rates of lab births as compared to euploid embryos. But, you know, for the whole chromosome uh, low level mosaic, uh, I think it's the last one. Yeah, so if there's any segmental, uh, you know, mosaic, low level mosaic with, without, you know, touching the uh, major chromosome, I think that's a great embryo to transfer. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. So you solve with the with the segmental. Uh, I want to add uh, one yeah. more point. Okay. I just thought of this. Um, you know, there was a paper published in uh, this year, and they are talking about plasticity of the human embryos. Our knowledge at this time regarding the pre-implantation embryos is not near completion. We do not know many things those are happening. Look at the genetic testing on day three as compared to day five. Within two days, many of those embryos which were considered abnormal on day three become normal on day five. So it means those embryos have uh, inherent ability to correct some of those errors. So more and more studies will be coming up on uh, the um, nature of uh, the, um, uh, uh, or on the subject of pre-implantation pre embryo. Again, when we are doing the PGT, we are taking the tissues from trophectoderm, which is not really reflective or uh, it, or if, it is not really a good image of the ICM. So we do not know the embryo is changing. The trophectoderm has to change to be acceptable to the recipient. So there is a kind of a uh, lot of things going on in between the embryo at that time and more and more studies will be coming up to, to make our understanding clear on those issues. 
thank you. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, we are coming to the end of the webinar. I would like to give you guys a minute to introduce your practice or your interests, and then we will wrap up. And I'll start with you, Bill. And you're muted. Uh, well, uh, Nabil, I uh, am, um, uh, you can say, a person who started this embryology and andrology many, many years ago, and I feel it's so amazing. I never uh, thought of changing the profession. Currently, I am working with Original Fertility Clinic in Ottawa, Canada. But before this, I have worked in the United States at the University of Michigan. Uh, thanks to Gary. And also I worked with uh, Dr. Casper in Toronto for eight years and in some other labs in the Middle East. So I love it every day. Every day is a new challenge and I take it as, uh, you know, it is my hobby. So I love it and uh, I'm very happy to be an embryologist. Thank you so much. Um, Bill, your turn. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, I did have one last question. Uh, is, and I'm surprised no one brought it up, but as Morid, your extensive home library, have you read all those journals and books behind you? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I got some time and you cannot believe, <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> last night, I slept at two o'clock. I did not realize the time. <laughs> he read them virtually, virtually, right? <laughs> Virtual background. Seven o'clock, it was 2 a.m. And today we started at seven. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy that I'm still able to speak and understand the question. Awesome. Very good. Very good. So um, I share uh, Maureen's uh, love for embryology and clinical IVF, helping patients. Um, I've been uh, with the docs at San Diego Fertility Centers since 94. Um, and then uh, Deb, my wife, and I started West. Um, this past year and uh, it, it's growing stronger. Um, and uh, our, again, our main goal is to recruit new people uh, into our field, educate them on our field, and of course, train them up uh, to get them into a lab uh, sooner than later. And uh, it's a pretty intense course. And it's, uh, it's designed to get them in a lab and maybe uh, have them, uh, you know, fully trained in the clinical setting uh, in six months to a year instead of two to three years. So that's our main goal. Thanks, Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Beck. Hi, I'm with CCRM, um, CCRM Network. I look after the mostly the Boston, Minneapolis, and Northern Virginia sites. My interests really rely in um, optimizing efficiencies and workflows for embryologists. Um, big thank you to Bill for bringing more people into the field. I think we all recognize right now that there is a, just seems to be a mass shortage of embryologists. So if anyone's looking, you know, if anyone has a, a youngster that is looking for a career, I, I highly recommend embryology. I think it feels like at the moment it's a, it's a job for life. Um, certainly for me, I love it. So I have no issues making that my, uh, my passion in life. Awesome. Thank you so much. You mean? Yeah, I, th I think um, it's a great pleasure to, uh, you know, work in this field. Uh, I have been studying this embryology um, 23 years ago, uh, working a few places. I just joined the Women Infant Hospital. Before um, that, I spent nine years in Wake Forest, North Carolina and also eight years in Stanford uh, Medical Center. So basically, I do like this job because, you know, to be honest, the infertility patient is extremely stressful, financially, you know, emotionally. Uh, so they do need your help. Um, you know, even we cannot guarantee 100%, you know, pregnancy or love birth, but, you know, the way we handle the patient, the way we understand the patient, the way we, we expect our passion, it really helps them a lot. So, so basically, I really enjoy, you know, this, uh, you know, this journey. Um, you know, so uh, basically, I hope, you know, the patient can, you know, um, uh, can, you know, um, understand, you know, it's it's not an easy 
journey and uh, you know we we try our best to be involved um, to contribute um, you know all of our efforts and also I think my interest is to you know to increase the rate for sure you know so so they all so currently there are a few tech, new technologies like uh, time apps and also artificial intelligence AI I think that's something you know I, I cannot predict how many years that could be used for you know clinical embryology but for sure, that's something, you know, uh, has potential value to help us to select the best embryo for transfer. Yeah, so thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, uh, Bill, Beck, Murid, and Yemin. Thank you so much for uh, your contribution and for, um, you know, introduction and, and the data that you have provided regarding 1PN, 3PN, and mosaic embryos. Thank you so much. In two weeks, we will have another webinar. Uh, I will send the notification soon about the topic. Thank you so much again, and I will see you in two weeks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.